Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube as well and you are not going to want to miss it. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are going over the case of Brittany Drexel. Now, if you are not familiar with Brittany's case, Brittany's case was actually a unsolved cold case for about 13 years, all the way up until it was recently solved just this month. This case definitely got a lot of attention in the media when it first took place and it has done so again more so recently because it has been solved and it definitely ended in a way that no one had expected. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Brittany Drexel was born on October 7th, 1991 in Rochester, New York to her mother, Dawn, and her father, John. Now, Brittany was born when her parents were very young. They were in their teenage years, so they didn't stay together very long. And when Brittany was very young, her mother, Dawn, ended up marrying a man named Chad Drexel, and then Chad ended up adopting Brittany, which is why she then got the name Brittany Drexel. Brittany also has a younger sister. Her name is Marissa. And so growing up, it was Chad, Don, Brittany, and Marissa all living in Rochester, New York, more specifically in Chile. And Chile is more so in the suburbs of Rochester. So that is what her home life looked like growing up. However, Chad and Don ended up getting a divorce in 2008 and then officially going ahead with the divorce proceedings in 2009. So Chad ended up moving out of the house. However, Brittany and Marissa still stayed and lived with their mother. And Brittany was in her teenage years when this divorce happened, and it definitely took a toll on her as it does for many children who have to go through that as well. But regardless of all of that, Brittany still did maintain very close contact with Chad even after the divorce. Now, Brittany was described as a young girl who was absolutely full of life. She excelled in sports and in school, and she particularly loved soccer. She was small in stature. However, she was able to run lightning speed on the soccer field. So Brittany was actually born with a rare eye condition, and this condition is called persistent hyperlastic primary vitreous, and it was in her right eye, and the condition caused her to have multiple surgeries and the result of the surgeries was she ended up being blind in her right eye. So her left eye had full vision, however, her right did not. And because of this, Brittany would often wear colored contacts or just contacts in general to try and make her eyes look as quote unquote normal as possible. And because of that, that really led her into her love for cosmetology. Brittany really loved beauty and cosmetology, and she actually wanted to be a cosmetologist and a model when she got older. So soccer and cosmetology were her thing. Those were her two passions. And at the time of her death, Brittany was 17 years old, and she was a junior in high school at Gates Chili High School. And similar for a lot of people, junior year was very very tough on Brittany. If you've ever gone through junior year of high school, you know that it is very difficult. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of pressure. Those types of grades matter the most for colleges a lot of the times. And so not only was she stressed out academically, however, her home life was also stressful as well with Dawn and Chad going through their divorce. But luckily for Brittany, spring break was coming up and she figured that this would be the perfect time for her to let loose and have fun and kind of forget about all of the stress that was going on back in her home life and at school. So Brittany did have a boyfriend at this time. His name is John Greico, and the initial plan was for Brittany, John, as well as some of their other friends to all go to Myrtle Beach together. Now, if you don't know, Myrtle Beach is in South Carolina, and it is a very, very popular little beach town with bars and restaurants, and it's a big spot for partying. It's great for families. It really has it all. 
The idea of going to Myrtle Beach seemed like the perfect opportunity for Brittany. She thought it would be great. She could go out with her friends and party and go to these bars and meet new people. And so Brittany ended up asking her mom, Dawn, if she could go to Myrtle Beach. However, her mother was very much against it. Dawn did not like the idea of Brittany going to Myrtle Beach for several reasons. The first being that Dawn was not familiar with any of the friends that Brittany said that she was going with other than her boyfriend, John. A second part was that there was going to be no adult supervision. And while that seemed like probably the biggest peak of it all for Brittany, that definitely left Dawn very worried. And overall, Dawn just had a mother's instinct feeling that something bad was going to happen on this trip. Not necessarily to Brittany, but she just had a feeling that something was going to go wrong. There was nothing good that could have came out of a bunch of 17-year-olds going down to Myrtle Beach with no supervision. So Dawn tells Brittany that she is not allowed to go to Myrtle Beach, and this caused a very big riff between Brittany and Dawn. It was very much a teenage daughter and mother type of argument. It lasted for several days, and for Brittany, she decided that she was going to go to Myrtle Beach with her mother's approval or without it. This is definitely when her rebellious side came out and she did what a lot of teenagers have done and that is lie to their parents. So this is when Brittany decides that she is going to come up with a new plan. And this new plan is going to be that she is going to tell Dawn, her mother, that she is going to a totally different spring break vacation. She tells Dawn that instead of going to Myrtle Beach, that her and her friend were going to go to her friend's lake house in Lake Ontario. Now, when Dawn heard this, she felt a lot more comfortable. She felt like she knew who this friend was. There was going to be adults there. And she just felt overall that this was the safer option. So she gave Brittany the green light to go to Lake Ontario. However, what Dawn didn't know is that the Lake Ontario plan never existed. Brittany had derived this plan up herself in order to get her mom off of her back, essentially. And she was still sticking to her original plan of going to Myrtle Beach with her friends. So on April 22nd of 2009, the plan was set off. Dawn thought that Brittany was leaving for Lake Ontario, when in reality, Brittany was packing up her car and beginning her drive down with her friends to Myrtle Beach. Now this drive took about three days, so they didn't end up getting to Myrtle Beach until April 25th. And that is when Brittany and her friends checked in to the Bar Harbor Hotel where they were staying. Now, Brittany's boyfriend, John, didn't end up going on this trip. It was just Brittany and her friends. John ended up staying back in Rochester and spending spring break with his family. He had some conflicting plans and he just couldn't go. So when Brittany checks in, she decides to give her mother a call. So she calls Dawn and tells Dawn that she's at the beach, which essentially Brittany wasn't really lying. However, Dawn figured that she was talking about a beach that was near Lake Ontario and not actually Myrtle Beach. So again, Dawn's still under the impression that Brittany is at Lake Ontario. So now that Brittany had officially gotten this phone call with Dawn out of the way, she was ready to get her vacation started because quite frankly, for Brittany, the three days of that drive leading up to getting to Myrtle Beach were miserable for her. Now, it's not quite clear how close she was to the friends that she went to Myrtle Beach with or how much she knew about them or if she was aware of any of this, but Brittany realized very quickly that the friends that she went to Myrtle Beach with were really heavy into the drug scene and that was just not what Brittany was interested in. And so because of that, she was just miserable. She wasn't having a good time and she was texting John throughout those three days leading up to getting to Myrtle Beach about how unhappy she was and about how she wanted the trip to be over already before it had really even started. And so because of that, on the first night that Brittany got there at around 8 p.m., she decided to separate from her friends 
The reason for this was because Brittany had made plans to see another friend of hers that coincidentally was also in Myrtle Beach. This friend was named Peter and she knew Peter from Rochester and John was familiar with Peter as well. However, it was definitely more of Brittany's good friend. So Peter was staying at the Blue Water Resort and the Blue Water Resort was about a mile and a half away from Brittany's hotel and Brittany was planning to walk there and then walk back. It was a 31 minute walk along the main strip, which is Ocean Boulevard. Peter was staying at Blue Water with some of his friends and Brittany was excited to hang out with them for a little bit and just kind of escape the friend group that she had gone there with. Now, the idea of walking alone at night really didn't scare Brittany very much. She figured that this was a very populated area, and Brittany was very trusting, you can say. An example of her being so trusting is that earlier that day, she had been walking along the boardwalk and was walking back to her hotel, and she was alone. And during this walk, she was being catcalled by many different men, and she actually had approached a random stranger, some random man, and asked this man if he would walk her back to her hotel room because she was uncomfortable with being catcalled. The man agreed to do it, and Brittany even offered to let this man into her hotel room after they got there, and nothing happened between the two of them. However, I think it is just a prime example of how trusting and a better word of it is frankly just naive Brittany was to her surroundings. So Brittany left her hotel to head to the Blue Water Resort at about 8 p.m. and she was wearing a black and white tank top, flip-flops, and a pair of shorts. And the security camera at the Blue Water Resort, which is where Peter was staying, captured Brittany on the security camera arriving to the resort. So we know that Brittany got there. We see her entering the hotel and walking in, and then it shows her leaving again at around 8.45 p.m. So it really wasn't a long stay at all. And this was pretty much due to the fact that Brittany was actually wearing one of her friend's jean shorts. And when Brittany got to Blue Water, her friend was texting her, telling her that she wanted to wear her shorts and Brittany had to come back right away so she could give her her shorts back. So Brittany only stayed at Blue Water for about 15 to 20 minutes before she ended up heading back. Now, throughout the entirety of this, Brittany and John were keeping in constant communication. Remember, John is the boyfriend. So Brittany and John are texting back and forth pretty much 24 seven throughout the entire day. She was keeping him updated when she was with Peter and then again updated when she was leaving and told him what the situation was. Now, John and Brittany were texting from 845 all the way up until about 9 o'clock, 9.10, when the text messages just stopped. At 8.45, Brittany texted John telling him that she was leaving Blue Water to head back to her hotel to give her friend her shorts. She also told John that she was just having a miserable time and was not planning on going out that night. However, John was being very optimistic about the situation. He told her that, you know, you went through all of this trouble just to get to Myrtle Beach. Now you're at Myrtle Beach, at least enjoy it. Have some fun. It's gonna go by so fast. Enjoy it while you can. However, Brittany never responded to that text message. And again, that was around 9 p.m. And due to the consistency that John and Brittany were texting each other and just their texting styles in general, John was very worried after Brittany had not responded to him. Even after just 10 minutes, John began to get very worried. That was how frequently they were texting. So John waited about 10 minutes and then 20 minutes went by and then 30 minutes went by. And John was texting Brittany throughout all of this, even though he was not getting a response. And because John was so worried, he ended up texting Brittany, basically threatening that if she did not respond to him, he was going to tell her mother that she was in Myrtle Beach and basically exploit this entire secret that she had kept. 
John did this basically to think that this would scare Brittany into texting him back. However, he still received no response. So he ended up calling some of her friends that were at Myrtle Beach with her. However, none of them had seen Brittany. They said that she never came back to the hotel room and they couldn't get a hold of her. Now, at that point, John knew that this, this was a problem. Something was very, very wrong. And so he ended up calling Dawn. So he calls Brittany's mother and basically tells her everything. Tells her that Brittany's in Myrtle Beach. There was never a plan to go to Lake Ontario. All of this was basically made up so Brittany could go, but now he's worried because he isn't able to get in touch with Brittany and is worried that something had happened. Now, obviously the first thing that Dawn is, is frustrated and angry because she specifically told Brittany not to go to Myrtle Beach. However, the secondary emotion, which then turned into the primary emotion was just fear and no one could get a hold of her daughter. So because of that, that same night, Brittany's family, as well as John, all got in their cars and started their drive down to Myrtle Beach. Now, John actually called the Rochester Police Department to try and see if there was anything they could do, if he could file a missing persons report, but obviously because it's out of the state and out of their jurisdiction, there really wasn't much that they could do. So John ended up calling one of his friends who was a Marine stationed in North Carolina, and he had told his friend the situation and had asked his friend to drive down from North Carolina to South Carolina in order to be able to file a missing person's report with the Myrtle Beach Police Department. And John had a great friend because that is exactly what this friend did. No hesitation. He drove down and was able to file a missing persons report. Now, the police were very quick to begin their search. However, they did have some hesitation at first. They thought it was very plausible, being the beach town that Myrtle Beach is, that Brittany could have just gone off to some bar or some restaurant or met up with some new friends, made some new friends. Maybe she got lost. They thought that there was a plethora of different possibilities that could have happened, which would have led them to this specific situation. They didn't necessarily think at first that anything was wrong. Now, obviously, since Peter was the last one to physically see Brittany, there were some eyes on him for sure. And what was very weird about Peter is that just a couple hours after Brittany had left his hotel room, Peter actually ended up leaving Myrtle Beach. So Peter and all of his friends ended up checking out of the Blue Water Resort at around 2 a.m. that next morning on April 26th and they left in a very strange way. A lot of their clothes and their belongings were still left in the hotel room, and obviously with them leaving at two in the morning, it seemed very, very suspicious. And when Peter got back to Rochester and ended up hearing that Brittany was missing, he did get a lawyer pretty quickly, which led a lot of people to raise their eyebrows at Peter because a lot of times, when you get a lawyer, the precedent is just, you know, you have something to hide. But Peter fully cooperated with police and he answered all of their questions. And he said that the reason that they left so abruptly and at two in the morning was because one of the friends that Peter was with, their parent had called them that night and told them that they had to leave Myrtle Beach immediately. Now we don't necessarily know why. However, all we know is that they listened and they packed up their stuff and they left. So after talking to Peter on several different occasions, he was eventually ruled out. So now police went on to look at traffic cams, hoping that they would be able to piece together where exactly Brittany went based off of those traffic cams. Now on her walk to the Blue Water Resort, the traffic cams did pick up Brittany on her way there. So police decided to map out where the traffic cams would have picked her up on the way back. Now from where the Blue Water Resort is to the first traffic cam that would have picked Brittany up, it was about 15 minutes. So about halfway of her walk. So police went to that footage and looked through all of it. However, when they went back and checked, they could not find Brittany on that footage anywhere. 
And that told police that Brittany's route to go back to her hotel was different than how it was to get there. However, we don't know why that was. So police then decided to look into Brittany's phone records, and this is when they started to realize that something could be wrong. At 9.27 p.m., so just a little over 30 minutes after John had last heard from Brittany, Brittany's phone pinged 6.8 miles south of Myrtle Beach and was in Surfside Beach, which is about a 16-minute drive south from the Blue Water Resort. After seeing that, police knew that something was definitely wrong. Police knew that there was no way that she could have walked that fast in that time frame, so they were able to confirm that she was most likely in some sort of vehicle in that time frame. Then, two hours later, her phone pinged 50 miles south of Myrtle Beach in a town called Georgetown, and after that, her phone either died or it just turned off. So police then went to Georgetown and started searching around that area. They brought in divers and helicopters and so many different resources. And at this point, police had very little hope that Brittany would be found alive. And this was just in the very beginning of the search. And the reason for that is because Georgetown is filled with many wild animals. They have wild boars, they have alligators, they have snakes. And police knew that if her body was dumped there, that more than likely she would have been eaten. And even if she was dropped off there alive, more than likely she would have been attacked by one of these animals. So basically months turn into years in this investigation and police still don't know what happened to Brittany. They are pretty certain at this point that they are looking at a homicide investigation. However, other than the pings coming from Brittany's phone, they really didn't have any substantial information. There were tips coming in here and there, but again, it was nothing concrete and nothing that was able to lead them in the direction to finding Brittany. However, in 2016, so seven years, after Brittany went missing, something interesting happened. Now this part might get confusing, but I'm going to try and explain it to the best of my ability. So in 2016, there was an FBI agent named Garrick Munoz, and Garrick was actually testifying at a bond hearing for a young man named Timothy Deshaun Taylor. Now the bond hearing was due to Timothy being a getaway driver after a 2011 robbery at a McDonald's. Garrick took the stand and said that earlier that year, a different inmate by the name of Taquan Brown had told the FBI that Timothy Taylor was responsible for Brittany's disappearance. So you have Taquan Brown, who was an inmate serving 25 years for manslaughter, telling the FBI agent Garrick Munez that Timothy Taylor and some of his friends were responsible for Brittany's death and disappearance. And then Garrick relays that information at Timothy's bond hearing. So according to Garrick, this is what Taquan told him. Taquan claimed that he personally saw Brittany at what he called a stash house in McClellanville, South Carolina. He said that shortly after Brittany's disappearance, he had to go to this house because Taquan owed the owner of the house, Sean Taylor, money. Now, Sean Taylor is Timothy Taylor's father. So Timothy was living in Sean's house at the time because he was 16 years old. According to Taekwon, he walked through the house and saw multiple men, including Timothy, assaulting Brittany. Now, Taekwon said that this money exchange happened in the backyard, so he had to walk through the house to get to the backyard to give Sean his money, which is how he was able to see Brittany being sexually assaulted by these other guys in the house. Now, according to Taekwon, he said that while he was giving Sean money, Brittany actually tried to escape. He said that Brittany ran out of the house, however, Timothy ran after her. He said that Timothy ended up catching her and brought her back inside. And after she was brought back inside, Sean Taylor, the father, walked inside of the house and he heard two gunshots. So Taekwon basically theorized that Sean, as well as Timothy Taylor, shot Brittany to death 
and then dumped her body in an alligator infested swamp that way her remains would not be able to be found now quickly after hearing this police jumped all over it and they tracked down sean and timothy again sean is the father timothy is the son and from the beginning timothy claimed that he was innocent and he did many many media interviews with news stations and dr phil saying that he had nothing to do with the kidnapping or alleged murder of Brittany. Now, part of the reason that police were so hard on Sean and Taylor is because just one month after Brittany's disappearance, Sean was arrested for an attempted kidnapping of a 20-year-old woman right outside of the Blue Water Resort. So it basically is textbook the same as Brittany's disappearance. So Sean gets arrested and he's put in prison and he's also put in prison for other things. Both Sean and Timothy do have a pretty long rap sheet. And so Sean gets put away, but Timothy is out. So after Sean was arrested for the attempted kidnapping, that is when Timothy was first brought in by police to talk to the FBI about Britney's case. Now, Timothy, again, he was 16 years old at this time, and he took a polygraph test and he passed it. So that was all in 2009. And after he passed the first polygraph he took, police really didn't have that much to go off of. And so it wasn't until 2016, when all of this got brought back up again at the bond hearing, that police really cracked down on Timothy. Police really believed that he did it and that he murdered Brittany and he was responsible for it, but they didn't have any real evidence to link him to her. Again, at this point, Sean was already put away, so all eyes really were on Timothy. However, he maintained his innocence the whole time and his story did not change. He said he never saw Brittany, didn't know Brittany, and just simply had nothing to do with it. He said that on the night of Brittany's disappearance, he was actually nowhere near Myrtle Beach, but in fact, he was at his cousin's block party in McClellanville. So that was his alibi. Now, in 2019, Taekwon Brown came forward again to do another interview, and his story changed this time. In this new interview, Taekwon said that that particular time that he went to Sean's house was not the only time that he had seen Britney there. He claimed that he saw Britney there on four different occasions. He claimed that these sightings happened over about a month and a half time period and that the time that he originally stated was only the second time he saw Brittany. He claimed to see her two more times after that. So he changed his story and it didn't really make a whole lot of sense considering that at first he had this whole theory that Brittany was shot and killed by Sean Taylor and Timothy Taylor was involved however he's then coming forward three years later and saying oh well that theory is not true because i saw her two more times after that and police really couldn't find anything to back up his story again they could not find anything to link timothy taylor or sean taylor to britney's disappearance and there was a reason for that and the reason for that is because timothy taylor and sean taylor had nothing to do with Britney's disappearance. Britney was never at the Taylor's house to begin with. They were not responsible for this, but now police know who was. Before we move any further, we're gonna take a quick second and thank our sponsors for today's video. If you guys have followed me back in my lifestyle video days, you would know that I tried Good American Jeans on for a video like years ago. And ever since, I have been obsessed. They are my favorite, favorite jean brand. I've seriously never had jeans hug my body like this and the fabric feels so luxurious and there is never a gap in the waistband. It's easy to see that this denim was designed to celebrate women's bodies and Good American offers a size range of, get this, double zero, all the way to 30 
too. I love Good American because they are all about inclusivity and body positivity and what makes it even better is that the brand is female founded. So if you want to try the jeans that will make you feel confident about your body and give you your best butt ever, go to goodamerican.com slash killer and use code killer at checkout for $50 off your first pair. Again, that's code killer for $50 off your first pair at goodamerican.com slash killer. For the longest time, kids have always learned what they have to at school. But when do they get to learn what they want to? Well, that'll happen when you sign them up for OutSchool. OutSchool offers live, online, and interactive classes for kids ages 3 all the way up to 18 years old. With the widest variety of subjects and teachers, they have something for every kid. Classes explore every interest you can think of and some you even can't, like karate, video game design, and how to become a YouTuber. You can choose the class size, instructor, teaching method, and group setting, giving your kid the learning experience that works best for them. Now, I do not have any children. However, I have suggested out school to all of my mom friends, my sisters who have kids, and all of the moms who have tried it with their children rave about out school. Out school brings kids together around their shared interests, helping them fall in love with learning, build confidence, and make new friends. Out school helps kids explore their interests and discover new ones. And right now for a limited time, you'll save $15 on your child's first class when you go to outschool.com slash instinct and use code instinct. That's O-U-T-S-C-H-O-O-L.com slash instinct code instinct to save $15 off your child's first class. Outschool.com slash instinct code instinct. So in early May of this year, 2020, I am filming this on May 23rd, 2020. This happened just a couple weeks ago. A 62 year old man named Raymond Moody came forward and confessed to being responsible for Brittany Drexel's death. Now we don't know too much about how this all went down, but what we do know is that this all started when he turned himself in to the Georgetown County Sheriff's Office for an obstruction of justice charge. So that was the initial arrest and then Brittany's confession came afterwards. Now, Raymond has been on the police's radar for a little over a decade regarding Britney's case. However, again, they didn't have anything to link him to the crime until now. Raymond Moody is a man with a pretty long rap sheet. In 2008, he was charged with indecent exposure in Georgetown, South Carolina. Then in 2010, he was charged with failing to register as a sex offender for a 1983 offense that he was charged with after sodomizing a child and that charge was sodomy of a child inflicting bodily injury. He was sentenced to 40 years for this. However, he ended up getting out in 2004, so he only served half of his sentence. He was only on parole supervision for three years following his release, and he was discharged from all parole supervision in 2007. And what we do know about Raymond is that one year before Britney's disappearance, him and his long-term boyfriend had supposedly broken up, and after that, he returned to a life of partying. Now, surprisingly enough, Raymond had actually had a girlfriend throughout the past 15 years. And remember, Britney's death was 13 years ago, so he was still in a relationship when Raymond murdered Britney. During his confession, Raymond had told police where the remains were and the FBI searched for days. However, on May 11th, human remains were located. They were found buried in the woods right off of a gated driveway outside of Georgetown, and the remains were found two and a half miles away from a motel where Raymond was living at the time of the murder. The remains were dug four feet into the ground, and through DNA records, they were able to positively identify them as belonging to Brittany Drexel. Now, we really don't know too many details. However, what we do know is that it is believed that Brittany was sexually assaulted and then strangled before she was buried. Raymond Moody has now been charged with murder, kidnapping, and first-degree criminal sexual assault, and he is eligible for the death penalty. 
Now, it has been said that Raymond and Brittany had no prior connection. He was 49 years old at the time of Brittany's death, and it definitely was an opportunistic killing. Investigators believed that Raymond more than likely offered Brittany a ride home, and she accepted it because she was just trusting. She believed in the good in the world, and she didn't think that anything bad would happen. Now that is the case of Brittany Drexel. And now that this case has been solved, it is just crazy and upsetting and horrible to see all that Timothy Taylor has gone through because for years, his name has been smeared for being the one that murdered Brittany. Even when his story didn't change and even when he was so adamant about his innocence and not saying that he or Sean Taylor is a saint whatsoever because they certainly have both done their own bad in the world. However, they were not responsible for this and police just kept looking and it was as if police just kind of wanted it to be them. So they just kept digging and kept digging and kept trying to figure it out when ultimately it was Raymond the whole time. It's also very upsetting to see that Taekwon Brown had made up the story about seeing Brittany at the Taylor home because it led police on such a wild goose chase to try and put two and two together. And you can't really blame police at first for looking into Timothy and Sean, considering the statement that was given by Taekwon. However, it really led, again, police on this wild goose chase and led them away from actually solving Britney's case. And it took time and resources away that could have been used to potentially solve Britney's case much sooner. Now, Timothy has not publicly made a statement and we are not sure if he will. However, we will be on the lookout for that. But that, you guys, is the case of Brittany Drexel. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed today's case. With that being said, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I'm the host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube as well. And you are not going to want to miss it. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye, guys. Bye.